So the last speaker before you all get to have lunch, so hang on with me just a little bit longer here, um, is Johanna, Johanna Zillery, and she is with SW Cole. She's a scientist there, and she's been working with um, the Maine Tidal Power Initiative actually for quite some time, probably since nearly the beginning. <laughs> and she's going to help us move down the coast, as Mick had talked about. Um, we've mostly been talking about Cobscook Bay and the ORPC site, um, but we've been talking with other folks in other places on the coast of Maine interested in tidal power development, and Johanna's going to tell you about um, some things we've been working with in the Wiscasset area. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Johanna Zillery. I'm an environmental scientist with SW Coal Engineering. Uh, as Gail said, I've been involved with the Maine Tidal Power Initiative since 2009, and at that time, um, we became part of MTPI to work with the Wiscasset site to kind of guide them through the regulatory process and also in that to try and develop a framework or a process that other interested developers could use and follow and hopefully improve. Um, the presentation that I'm giving, the Tidal Power Site Evaluation, what we learned in the process, the data that we gathered, um, this is, in fact, developed by Peter Arnold and Jim Churchill. Jim Churchill is an oceanographer with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and Peter Arnold was the um, sustainability coordinator for the Chewanke Foundation. Um, so I'm going to do my best to relay the information. The Wiscasset site is shown on this map. It is about... Um, 45 minutes northeast of Portland, and what's unique about the Wiscasset project is, unlike most of the hydrokinetic projects right now, this project is driven by a municipality. The site assessment um, was driven by the Chewanke Foundation working with the town of Wiscasset. So what we're hoping is that this project will be a model for community efforts elsewhere and that those communities can add to the knowledge and improve this process. In May of 2009, the town of Wiscasset was awarded a Federal Energy Regulatory Commission preliminary permit to investigate the feasibility of hydrokinetic power um, within their permit area. Peter Arnold, as I mentioned, was the project manager. Peter worked for the Chewanke Foundation, but was essentially a uh, representative for the town of Wiscasset. Uh, we also want to recognize some of the financial supporters for the project, Gordon Hall, Dot Kelly, and the Maine Tidal Power Initiative. This map shows the area that was permitted in the preliminary permit. If you folks know um, the area, of the Wiscasset Bridge is, oh, I can just reach it right above there, the Route 1 Bridge. What I also want to point out in this slide is Westport Island. This will become important further on in the talk. So as we began part of this process, there were three key components of the site assessment that um, are important. Uh, the power resource, how much energy might we be able to extract from the water on the site, and what's the suitability, what's the interconnection like. Um, how can we get the power from the water onto land and then into the grid? The next component that's pretty important is how does the community feel? Uh, who are the stakeholders and how are we going to work with them? Um, and this ties in with the last component. Um, what are the protected resources in the area? Certainly when we think of the protected resources, what are the fisheries in the area? Oh. Okay, who, uh, what are the fish species, but what are the other protected natural resources, wading birds, wetlands, um, a whole slew of things that we want to consider. So the power resource, uh, the community, and the natural resources. And because this talk was developed by Jim Churchill, we're going to focus initially on his assessment and how he went through the power resource assessment. 
there are three steps that he went through in this, and um, this is an incremental process, both in terms of resources invested, time, and money, but it's also a process that's incremental. Um, when you go through the first step, it informs the next step. Um, we have a decision-making process from one to two. Is it worth it to continue based on the potential energy available at the site um, and based on the resources that we have? So the first step, hydrodynamic modeling, um, as Jim recounted it to me, this is a desktop exercise that he's able to do in his office uh, with available data. So this model grid is something that he set up with pretty much easily available data. It's the simplest available model in his toolbox, as he called it. Um, and he uses this because it's a quick setup. And um, this shows some of the results of the model. This is a contour of the water volume through the system. What he wanted me to point out here is this tidal node <coughs> just west of Westport Island. And this is pretty important in understanding the energy dynamics of this estuarine system. Essentially, what happens at that tidal node that's to the west of Westport Island, this shows the, um, the current vectors through the system. Uh, because of the bathymetry in this part of, in this estuary, what happens is the current comes in just south of Westport Island. It splits on either side of the island. And because the eastern channel's deeper, the wave propagates faster. And as it comes around to the other side of the island, there's essentially a, what I understood to be a dead spot in the current on the west side of Westport Island. And that's what the tidal node is. And he says this is, um, in, in addition to being a pretty neat fact, it's also very important in understanding the dynamics of the system and the energy, energy distribution. So uh, his, his simplified model also allowed him to model the power distribution within the system. We see um, a larger shot and then the FERC permit area on the um, right panel. And he said, basically, this, was the, this is the decision-making step. So if we look at relatively, there are four areas of relatively high power density within the system that if we wanted to continue to the next step and put more money and resources into this, um, these are the areas that we would look. So after some decision-making with Peter Arnold and with other folks at MTPI, uh, the group decided to do a spatial velocity survey. We took those four areas, you see highlighted in green on this map, and um, did a day-long spatial velocity survey in the, in the permit area. And as I understand it, the day before the survey, um, Peter and Jim kind of cruised around and looked, and Jim decided he was curious and added a fifth area. So that's why, actually, you see five areas on the map. The uh, survey consisted of, within each of those regions, cruising back and forth across the channel several times, then moving, picking up the ADCP, and moving to the next selected area. This, they, then they went around to all five areas. That took about an hour. They spent 12 hours doing this and got several um, observations at each site. The actual surveying equipment looks like this. Um, Jim called this the ADCP, the acoustic Doppler current profile that can travel. Um, it's mounted uh, onto any vessel that is available at, in this case. It was the uh, seagull with its captain, Stanley King. Um, the ADCP is self-powered and has its own uh, GPS unit. And the results, these are the, again, the five surveyed areas. The results show that the best area, um, if you folks know the area, it was right in the vicinity of the Westport Island Bridge. Jim said kind of going into it, he suspected this. Bridges are often located at the narrowest, at narrows, and you would expect that this constriction increases flows. So 
he was kind of glad to have that notion verified. This is an aerial shot of the vicinity under the bridge and that provided the best flows. The results showed that the, um, the tidal cycle followed a nice sinusoidal curve, um, showed currents of about one meter per second. Jim was careful to know that this was, the survey was conducted not necessarily during the best time. Um, it was actually at the neap tide. It was when his schedule allowed, not when we would find the best tidal flows. He was able to extrapolate the data and he worked with Peter and they discussed and said, okay, we didn't do it at the best time, but this is my estimate of if we did it at a better time, what we would find. And again, this is another decision-making process. Do we go forward? Um, and in consultation again with Peter Arnold and with MTPI, uh, we decided to do the more velocity profiling. This is a full month-long lunar cycle investigation. We were fortunate to be able to work with Carl Wilson at the Maine Department of Marine Resources. Um, they did a multi-beam survey of the area that provided a lot more detailed information and this is that detailed information on bottom uh, on the depth profile right in the vicinity of the Westport Island Bridge. Then taking this information and talking with Ocean Renewable Power Company we wanted to know what's the minimum depth of water that we would need in order to be able to operate a unit in the area. And um, I had found, and I think Jim and Peter would agree, that ORPC was great to work with. Uh, they spent a lot of time both educating us on the technology and sharing what they had learned about the process as well. So we took this depth data, what we heard from ORPC, and um, Jim overlaid his channel survey um, to plan where we would deploy the um, ADCP unit for the month-long survey. That, that um, equipment looks like this. This is an ADCP unit mounted to a tripod. The transducers uh, face upward. This is mounted on the, or moored on the, on the substrate. Um, he brings his technician, Jay Sisson, along with them um, to deploy and to recover the unit. At the Wiscasset site, this was deployed from October 27th to November 29th, 2011, so a full lunar cycle and a couple days. And the data that we got from, the, the Jim worked up from that is shown here. Um, we've got speed, on the left graph we've got speed on the bottom axis. Um, and what you're looking at here is from the surface and then increasing in depth. So what we see is that the greatest speed is about four meters below the water at just under one meter per second. The highest power density is at about four or five meters below the surface. And that's 700 watts per square meter. Uh, the bottom line here is that, um, again, we find the best speeds and the best power density just below the surface, but in talking with our PC and other developers, what's commercially available for a tidal turbine unit at this time, this is about five to ten times less than what's viable. Um, Jim wanted me to point out also what he was pleased with is that this verified his desktop model. Um, it fit well in with what his model predicted. So um, he was pleased with that. At the same time uh, that we were working to figure out what the power resource was, um, SW Cole was involved with MTPI, and I'm glad that uh, Teresa and Jessica both talked about their re research work with uh, social science and public outreach. Um, we wanted to develop a way to engage the public and regulators. Um, so we started thinking about who are the stakeholders and what are the, what's the kind of information that they need. 
um, how do we interact with these folks, and Jessica and Teresa both talked about this. Um, working with regulators and in permitting, um, I think about these things also, and um, you know, who do we engage and when, and how often do we talk to them. Um, as I understand, this work is still ongoing at the Wiscasset site. Uh, we also wanted to include an assessment of the natural resources, fish, fish species. Um, another thing that came up when we talked with regulators was um, wading birds. And uh, so we worked with, um, uh, sorry, these slides start touching on the work that SW Cole did. And our approach was similar to Jim's. It's an incremental approach. Um, so we first reached out and worked with the regulators and said, what do you know about the um, species that are present in the Sheepskit and Back Rivers? What are the known resources? Uh, what are the protected and known species that we already know exist in the area? And uh, as we worked through this process, three species came up in particular that regulators were concerned about, Atlantic sturgeon, short-nosed sturgeon, and Atlantic salmon. So we get, began working with Maine De, uh, Department of Marine Resources, Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, to name a few. Um, I was fortunate to work with Gail Zedluski, who has um, worked with uh, a collaborative effort um, that includes state and federal, re uh, state and federal entities, um, USGS Marine Resources, NOAA, and um, she's been involved in some sturgeon research. There are, there's an array of acoustic receivers that is shown on this map. Um, throughout the, let's see, in yellow we've got the Penobscot River array of acoustic receivers. Uh, the Kennebec River array is shown in red, and then a couple other coastal rivers in black. Um, these acoustic receivers, which look, are shown up in the upper right-hand corner, detect tags that are embedded in um, sturgeon. In this case, we were particularly interested in sturgeon. Um, those transmitters are shown on the upper left. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Gail. <laughs> um, so we were, lu were lucky to have this resource in Maine, um, and because of we were able to work with Gail in this project. Um, Gail deployed a acoustic receiver at the Westport Island Bridge that's shown in the star. And basically what we were trying to get at is some of what Jeff's talking about. Who's present in this river system, in the Sheepskit and Back Rivers? When, for how long, what time of year, and how long are they staying? So a, um, an acoustic receiver was deployed off the Westport Island Bridge, and that's actually the Back River, um, from October 2010 to July 2011. Six individuals for short-nosed sturgeon. Six short-nosed sturgeon were detected primarily within the month of May. Um, they had different residence times. Um, if you're wondering what .006 days translates to, <laughs> That's eight minutes. <laughs> um, these individuals were originally tagged in the Penobscot River, so they're traveling a distance. For Atlantic sturgeon, again, that same acoustic receiver detected five individuals. The Atlantic sturgeon had a much broader um, activity window, February, March, April, and June, and came from the Merrimack and Saco rivers. Um, so this gives us a flavor for the kind of species and their activity times that we're dealing with. So to circle back to where I started, um, the town of Wiscasset began this to try and figure out, can we have a, what, what's the potential for tidal power in this uh, permit area? And uh, what we found is that a stepwise approach is the best way to approach this. Um, it helps to partner with someone like the Maine Tidal Power Initiative or other nonprofit researchers, um, both to share data and um, to have a broader variety of resources. 
And because this is Jim Churchill's presentation, his suggested first step would be assessment through hydrodynamic modeling. Um, but because I'm giving it, I'm going to tell you that I think it's also very important at the same time to consider the natural resources and to talk with regulators and to see what they know about um, the area you're planning. And that's all I have.